Herlock, and as my colleague has said, no one in this House needs reminding, but perhaps some in the United Kingdom do need to recall that it was the British Government that decided to have a referendum to leave the EU. It was the British Government that decided to have a hard Brexit and to leave the single market in this way that they want to. It was the British Government that were found out and the impact that would have on the island of Ireland. And it was the British Government, of course, that agreed the withdrawal treaty, the protocol, and brought the relevant instruments through their own Parliament. It is, of course, the British Government now that, in essence, tried to plead ignorance, whether ignorance of the terms they agreed, ignorance of the, that they were likely to be applied, ignorance of the effect it would have on the crucial east-west dimension of the Good Friday Agreement, ignorance that there would be a challenge caused by those actions to the operation of the Good Friday Agreement. But it's not the protocol, of course, that causes the challenge to the agreement, as is attempted to be said. It is and always has been the decision of the British Government to choose to have had the hardest possible Brexit. It is the decision not to explain the impact of Northern Ireland in the course of the referendum, or even to reali in reality to acknowledge the existence of it as an issue. It was the decision to continue to push the extreme positions, as my colleague Deputy Richmond has said, the hardest possible position as a first course, the hardest Brexit possible, threats to invoke Article 16, the threats in the theatre that have brought the British government now to this honestly desperately sad position that it is in in the eyes of the international partners that it has had. It is the decision to play local inter-party transient politics over the commitment of the United Kingdom to their position of co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement, or indeed to international law more broadly. And the steps taken on legacy discussed in detail in this House and on which we are united in this House were a further reflection of this abrogation of responsibility, although we have seen positive steps today in relation to the Identity and Language Bill in Northern Ireland, which I really welcome. Always in politics, we are reaching for dialogue, for compromise, for facilitating each other. This was the very essence of the Good Friday Agreement itself on all parties, and we have had an opportunity for sustained, peaceful development of this island as a consequence of those steps towards each other of those compromises and credit is due to all for that, including to the EU, who has acted as a guarantor of the agreement and funded so many projects of reconciliation and development for Northern Ireland and for the United Kingdom. The Northern Ireland Protocol is, of course, a mutually agreed solution to the challenges posed by the choice by the British government of the type of Brexit that they want to have to Northern Ireland. Agreed after long negotiations between the EU and the UK, it protects the, United, the Good Friday Agreement in all its dimensions and is broadly supported by people and in, by business in Northern Ireland. We've said in this House and seen in the Good Friday Agreement Committee representatives of business from Northern Ireland, representatives of business representative groups, chambers of commerce, who remind us that there are huge opportunities that come from the protocol and that the issues, that practical issues that have been there can be and have been worked through. The then DUP leader Arlene Foster, in welcoming the trade deal reached between the EU and the UK in December 2020, said she welcomed the successful conclusion of negotiations and that it was the start of a new era in the relationship between the UK and the EU and in Northern Ireland. We will want to maximise the opportunities the new arrangements provide for our local economy. In a further statement, she said, Ms Foster referenced that it was a sensible deal that was almost the most favourable outcome for Northern Ireland. Quote, she says, moving forward, we will continue to work to seize the opportunities and address the challenges which arise from the United Kingdom's exit from the European Union, she said. Now, that statement is no longer available on the DUP website in my searches in any event. Perhaps it has been deleted. These things do happen. But if the position has changed, we have to ask why. Because the realities of, the sing of leaving the single market remain. The realities of trade on this island remain. Nothing has changed. Not the rules and not the desire to make it work. The desire to make the post-Brexit relationship work is unchanged. The desire to work out the practical problems is unchanged. Just look at how the medicines issue has been quietly resolved by the EU with very little fanfare over the last few weeks. Nothing has changed except that new barriers seem to be found, except there is still the space to change. There is still the space for the United Kingdom government to change. Yet, in the article published today, I think in the Express, Arlene Foster now says the protocol has to be fundamentally changed. And as Deputy Rich Richmond has mentioned in the Irish Times today, far the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, Liz Truss, says the protocol is the biggest challenge to the Northern Ireland executive getting back to work. The Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom says that the problems of the protocol are baked into its text. This is the text agreed by her same government, of which she has been a member. It really is hard to take seriously. And we are moving from obfuscation now to pure bad faith. 
the threat that follows in her article today, that of we cannot allow any more drift and delay. Keep in mind that negotiations have been essentially stalled in real terms since February. That without an executive no, and no prospect of one until these current concerns can be addressed, we need to provide reassurance to Northern Ireland that the problems with the protocol will be fixed one way or another. That's my emphasis. She goes on to say that the UK has a duty to take the necessary decisions to preserve peace and stability. That is why I have announced our intention to introduce legislation in the coming weeks. End quote. It is hard to overstate how irresponsible that position is. It is hard to overstate the bad faith that is the application of internal party politics to free trade on this island. There is still space to change. There is still space to to, for example, come closer back into the single market fold, there is always more than one way to change. The EU has worked to accommodate the political desires of the United Kingdom. It has found together the solution to the decision to have a hard Brexit and to give Northern Ireland the opportunity to trade in the broadest and most constructive way. It is time now for the United Kingdom to step up to who they used to be, respectable partners in peace and stability that worked towards the Good Friday Agreement and guaranteed its stability, committed to the rule of law and committed to international law. There is still the space to come back yet, and although this government may not be listening, I do hope there are those in Whitehall today and in other parties, and perhaps in Tories yet to come, who can remember and who will bring the United Kingdom back into the fold of being an international partner of peace and stability. I look forward to that day of renewed partnership but we have to get over this day of obfuscation and bad faith first. Thank you, Carolyn.